what went into that initial decision to go self pub? <laughs> Desperation. Desperation. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a situation where Robin read my books and she said, I want to publish these. And I said, okay, we'll try that. And then no one wanted to pick it up. She says, well, I don't care. We're still going to publish these. I'm like, all right, how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to sell them out the back of the truck. Okay, we'll do that. And then she sent out all these emails. One came back positive, and that's how it started. And then when I did do well, self-publishing, uh, then she said, okay, hello, New York. Would you like another stab at this thing? Because it's making oodles of money. You might want to have part of the cash. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 69 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always, my co-host, the Chewy to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, MJ Kuhn. How's it going, MJ? Hello, I am fabulous. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. And if you'd like to support MJ and her work, you can pick up Among Thieves, which is her debut novel. It's a fantastic, riotous adventure with a bunch of characters who screw each other over. Lots of twists, lots of fun, lots of heists, and I know you're going to love it. And if you want to pick up the sequel, Thick as Thieves, it is out now. <laughs> MJ's got it right there. Yeah. As well, a quick note for listeners, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live, so check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app, and subscribe to the Fanfatic YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. Also, shout out to our newest patron on Patreon, Michael Tellez. Thank you so much for supporting us and supporting the show. And now, welcoming today's incredible guest, Michael J. Sullivan, best-selling author of The Rayera Re Revelations, The Rayera Chronicles, and much more. Hello there, Michael. How are you doing? Hello there. I uh, hate to mention this, but as we come on the air here, the Rain has just started pouring, so I'm <laughs> totally hearing you because we have a metal roof. But that's oh, a it's all good. <laughs> it's one of those fun things that happens. The right. gods just pouring down upon us. Exactly. <laughs> I can hear it a little. It sounds cozy from our end, but oh, I'm sure it's, nice. it's just not a great loud. thing to have on audio. That's <laughs> No, it's all good. I got like a little, uh, I got a little add on for my, my audio program to, to cut out background yeah. noise, but there we go. for anyone who doesn't hear the rain, there is rain. Yes. <laughs> all right. So, um, to get started for anyone who isn't familiar with you and your work, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, I write fantasy novels. I write uh, a whole bunch of fantasy novels. I think I've got about 20 of them out now. Started writing, uh, let's see. First ones got published uh, traditionally about 10 years ago. I started writing them about 20 years ago. Uh, so, but they're mostly, I don't know how to describe them. I suppose they start out sort of sword and sorcery, small, but then they grow into massive epic. And uh, I have all of these three, one, two, three, four different series, and they interconnect into one gigantic magical world. Uh, so. And the lab it. In the Ark. <laughs> and the last book in the Ark. It's coming out tomorrow. Oh, you want me to plug my book? Uh -oh. <laughs> Robin's there for the business. I am books. really <laughs> awful at plugging my own books. When, I, when, I, when I'm on panels, I will not put the book up for people to know just because it annoys me. But yes, <laughs> because I have a gun to my head back over here, I'm going to let you know that I have a book coming out. Uh, it, he, he got to show his. And by the way, Adrian, you don't, don't cover... Don't cover her name next time <laughs> you do it. Yeah, see, you, you had like a finger over the L. Yeah, yeah. So this is yeah, it's, by, it's by it's by Jay Coon. Exactly. There interested. we go. <laughs> so the infamous Jay Coon. And you can see it, it's unusually large for me. Uh, but this will be coming out in two days, I think. Yes. In so early. excited. Congratulations right. so excited. on that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's dive into your nerd origin story. This is something I always love to talk about uh, with, with our guests. I'm curious how you got into science fiction and fantasy. Like, do you remember the first book, series, TV show, film, whatever it was that like swept you off into a fantastical land and just caught your heart? Yeah, I remember all of them. You don't have enough time for this. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this will be the whole episode. <laughs> it has. She's sitting over there right now going, give them the short form. Give them the short form. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so I hated reading, didn't like it for a long time. At the age of 12, I read a really crappy little coming of age book just so that I could say to myself, when I'm 60, look, I actually finished a book cover to cover once and I would be proud of that. Didn't like it. Next book I picked up was Lord of the Rings and it was just calling to me from a shelf one day and I started reading it and I got really into that. And then I went out to the bookstore after that to look for another book just like it. And guess what? There wasn't because this was like 1974 and they didn't have many of them. So that's how I started writing because I couldn't find anything to read. So I started writing myself when I was in high school and, you know, like a notebook and stuff. And then I moved on to a little typewriter. So that's how I started writing. Uh, I did that for a very long time and I uh, didn't really have too much formal training. So I actually taught myself by reading and writing and reading and writing. I did this for about 20 years. Um, then finally, uh, I wrote everything. I mean, I ran into my wife. I mean, my wife is a very intelligent person, and she was sitting down one day. And she told me, she says, hey, you ever read Stephen King? And I'm like, who? And she goes, oh, he's a great new book out <laughs> called like, The Stand. And I'm like, oh. So obviously, this was back before he was well-known around the world. Yeah. Uh, so I started reading him, and I started reading a lot of other subjects, and I, I actually stopped reading fantasy almost altogether. So for the most part, I wrote – Bring up Babylon 5. I will. Right. <laughs> I haven't got there yet. <laughs> uh, I started writing. Hold uh, on. I started reading all kinds of things: horror stories, uh, you know, science fiction, all kinds of different things. I've got there, and uh, I started writing those. Now, flash forward uh, several, couple decades, and I was watching television, and I saw Babylon Five. And on Babylon Five, I was fascinated by the concept of this wonderful story arc that he wrote five seasons in advance of his first show, which is crazy because he didn't even know that it was going to be picked up necessarily, which I loved because that allowed him to do all these really great story arcs over the course of the series. And you find out that main character doesn't even appear to the second season. It's amazing. And I thought, wow, this is the future of television. And then I saw Buffy the Vampire Slayer, same deal. I mean, they have this long going arc <laughs> over top of these little episodes. I mean, this is where TV's going. And then Reality TV kicked in. <laughs> just fucking ruined everything. And everything changed. And everyone who no. could to stop. So, yeah, I got a little disappointed in that. But what I did was I said to myself, well, hell, if I was going to write for television, I would write a medieval fantasy because I've never seen one on TV that was done any that was done well at all. Uh, this is obviously back in the 1990s, late 90s, early 2000s. So like there was nothing like there either slapstick comedy or they were. There was, that was like the era of Xena and Hercules yes, and that yes, kind of stuff. Just, <laughs> I wanted a real television show. And so I went, well, I can't, I can't make one, but I can write books. So I started writing novels set in the fantasy world because that's what I was thinking would be great for a television show. And uh, I had different episodes for the longer story arc over the whole thing. And that's pretty much how it came about. That's amazing That's though. Awesome. I, yeah. I love that. Like it's, it's great when, when people are creative enough to think like this thing doesn't exist for me, at least the thing that I would be interested in. So like, fuck it. I'm going to start writing it myself. And yeah, that's, I feel like that's where the best stories school, come from. Yeah. 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 They this come is, from writing what you want to read. This is something I actually tell young authors is that basically don't try to follow the trend, find what isn't out there what you want to see and fix that by providing it. And that's what I ended yep. up doing. And it turns out, of course, that became something that people liked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on that note of not following the trend, you got into indie publishing and self-publishing quite early on. So it's like the Rayura Chronicle or Revelations, you originally did that self-pub. I think the first one was in 2008. Uh, the first self-pub? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so we started self pubbing in 2007 because we didn't think anyone wanted to pick me up. And we literally went and had the books published and we were going to sell them out of the chunk of the car. And <laughs> then we found out a publisher wanted me. So we ended up going through a traditional publisher. But after a couple of books, they had money flow problems and we ended up getting the rights back. And then we self pubbed at that time. But that was the time when ebooks came out. So yep. life got a lot easier in that respect. So yeah, that was 2008 to about, uh, I want to say 2009-ish, a little bit, almost in 2010. And yeah. then I got picked up by New York. Well, What went into that initial decision to go self-pub? <laughs> Desperation. Desperation. <laughs> I mean, it was, I mean, it was, I it was it. a situation where Robin read my books and she said, I want to publish these. And I said, okay, we'll try that. And then no one wanted to pick it up. She says, well, I don't care. We're still going to publish these. I'm like, 
all right, how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to sell them out the back of the truck. Okay, we'll do that. And then she sent out all these emails, one came back positive, and that's how it started. And then when I did do well, self-publishing, nice. uh, then she said, okay, hello, New York. Would you like another stab at this thing? Because it's making oodles of money. You might want to have part of the cash. And that's kind of how that rolled in. Yeah, I love that. Because that's, awesome. I mean, that's one of my favorite things about the self-pub market is it's just because trad pub doesn't think that there is a readership for it does not mean that there's not a readership. Uh, and we've seen it now time and time again, but this is, you know, you're just one of the, the early examples of that. And I love that. Um, so we love feel good stories here on the show. <laughs> so so no, I want to know terrible stories. We, we do. Stories we are negative. No, <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what has been one of your like favorite or like the coolest author moments that you've experienced in your career. Like if you have a, interaction with a reader or I don't know, just some moment that stands out to you. Well, I, have to, the, the, I would have to like sit down and listen, but I, I do recall a few where there was one time when, so I'm not that well known, at least I don't think I am. And I would go to, to conventions and I recall they were usually very, they're uh, unpleasant because like they were really humiliating because I would go in and sit and no one would ever come up to have a book signed or anything. So, but I remember when I first started catching on, I noticed that cause I was at, I think it was Gen Con. And I was, we went and we sat in the hotel lobby and, uh, you know, there, there's a number of couches and, and someone came up and they, and they said, excuse me, but can we sit here? I said, well, sure. You know, it's like <laughs> the hotel lobby, I can't prevent you. And, <laughs> and somebody slowly seat. caught on. They kept asking me, they would say, you know, like, you're, you're, I really love your books and stuff. I went, oh, you didn't mean, can you sit physically in the chair? You meant you, can you sit and talk to me? <laughs> sit with me. <laughs> cool. And I and I, I like that one and and then one person came by and I think she had a uh, who wrote the thieves book uh, Scott Lynch Scott and Lynch. she had Scott Lynch's book which didn't have mine and she saw me she's like oh my god it's Michael J Sullivan I wish I had something for you to sign I went what's that she goes it's Scott Lynch's book I said I'll sign that she goes really I said sure <laughs> so I signed it and I said she loves me best Scott. <laughs> and it was funny because a little bit later she posted that online and i hope scott saw it <laughs> oh my gosh i love that that's so funny <laughs> so, oh, dude, those are great. kind of fun things but i'm sure there's many of them well yeah. dude, that that is a perfect that is kind of a perfect setup for what our next episode will be about teaser it's yeah. about building a dedicated fan base exactly. take that scott lynch no <laughs> <laughs> um okay so let's dig a little bit into the world of Alan more specifically um, so you mentioned how you, uh, uh, how you started writing when you were in high school and how that progressed and everything. And you were inspired by Babylon five, Buffy, the vampire slayer, both fantastic shows, by the way, uh, to write something that you wanted to see on TV, essentially. Um, what was it like at the beginning to kind of dig into it and start working on the series that would eventually become the Ray era revelations? Uh, it's going to be a little bit different than what I think most people would expect because, well, first of all, I, I had written 13 full-length novels by the time this happened. And I had quit. I had quit entirely. I was never going to write again. Ten years went by. I wasn't writing anything. But I got really bored, and I, I always considered boredom to be the mother of creation. So really, really bored, nothing to do. And I kept having this idea of these two guys climbing a tower to steal a sword, and they find the dead body of the king. And I went, this is a great opening scene. Like if it was a television show. And I so that's what I wanted to do. And I just went, well, what the heck? I'm bored. So I just started ripping this thing out. And I was so non-creative for so long that I literally wrote the first book in a month. And then I wrote the second book in the following month. So September, I wrote The Crown Conspiracy. And in October, I wrote Avon Partha. And I started the third book right away. And I was sending these off to a friend of mine who was, had, had obviously better grammar than I did. Uh, just to see how it work out. And he was editing it for me. And he wrote back and he said, are you aware that you're writing a novel a month? I went, is that <laughs> odd? I mean, how would I know this? <laughs> you're like, I don't know the face. <laughs> He's going to think it was strange. Uh, so I ended up writing like that whole series just on the side and I was never going to publish it. So I was just making stuff up. I was drawing from what I had already known from writing novels and from what I had read uh, novels. And I would just like, put together what I wanted to see. And it wasn't until I got the very end and I was finishing up the final book and the house was empty. Kids are at school, wife's at work. And I typed the last line of the novel and I was like, Oh my God, 
this is like the greatest thing ever. I went, I created something truly amazing. And I just like got up and I'm like, yes. And there's no one there. <laughs> <laughs> so and, it's like, and because every previous book I'd ever written went from my typing it to in a drawer, never to be seen again, it was really depressing because this time I knew I made something great and no one was ever going to see it. So it was this huge rush and then crash. And that was how I got into it. But I mean, I never really like sat down and like planned everything out. It was pretty much off the top of my head. And, uh, you know, I outlined obviously as I was working on it, but I didn't really like spend a lot of time working out the world building or any other of the aspects that you would expect an author to do. I had some great characters. I thought of, I'm like, what has never been done before? I'll do that. And this looks like it would go this way. So let's go that way. And so it was just me kind of winging it as I went along because I, I never planned on making this successful. I never planned on having this right. ever make any money. I wasn't going to publish it. Very much like the creator of Babylon 5. <laughs> yeah, like, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like straight up. You you wrote it for yourself. And I think those are the those are the moments where obviously it would have been great to have that success uh, or that, that successful, like I finished that last that last sentence. And there was someone there that I could like high five or hug or celebrate right. with. Like, yeah. <laughs> I got to like, that point so I could let them read it. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. I mean, how many, people, how many people would read my books? I've heard this from people. They say, you know, I just got done reading it and I go online to, you know, come talk to the fan base and say how great it was. It's like, and I can't find anyone who's read your books. Now, this is hopefully a while ago and hopefully mm -hmm. it's changed, but I don't know. You have whole wikis now. It's a while ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm a wiki. Like, you do. You do. There is yeah. a wiki. <laughs> That's the beauty of the internet. Someone created a wiki. Mm -hmm. It's out there. Someone's read yeah. my books. At least one person. There you go. <laughs> Other <Yeah>. than yeah. <laughs> one very dedicated or person. Or secretly Robin created the wiki for you. <laughs> <laughs> I know all about that wiki. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, hush, yeah, hush, don't give away my secrets. <laughs> right, don't give away the <laughs> secrets. Oh, that's amazing. Because I was going to ask what part of the story came first, you know, when you were uh, conceptualizing it. But it, I, it sounds like you did just start from that image well, that is so great in, in the first book. In yeah. fact, what I ended up doing was I, I kind of envisioned it. Well, I really wanted to write the last book. But to do that, I had to, like, build up the characters. And I kind of pictured it would be a four, well, a five book series. Cause I, I kind of went, okay, this is going to, cause I wanted it to take place in different settings. I never wanted to have the same book twice. So the stories all had to be different. They all had a different setting. So I'm like, okay, I'll have this one here, this one here. And when I got done, for those of you who know my books at all, uh, after Avon Partha, there is no empire, but as the start of Emerald Storm begins, there is. And I'm like, when did that happen? And I'm like, oh crap, I have to write a book <laughs> where this happens. And I didn't have any plot ideas at all. So I just went, I'm just going to start writing and see where this goes, which is why it kind of come out the way it does. Now, some people don't like that, but other people I think that's the best book or the first really great book of the series. Cause like, this is where it got good. And I'm like, I was just trying to fill in a hole. Yeah. I didn't have a wiki. <laughs> To, to work yeah, off. To yeah. Reference, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things a lot of readers love about the books, you know, I think um what, what MJ mentioned a little bit earlier is like that that classic fantasy feel that a lot of fantasy readers love. And combining that with a more modern, uh more accessible, readable kind of format. You know, you said that you you had read Lord of the Rings when you're, when you're younger, but then, you know, you didn't have too much after that because you were kind of writing for yourself and, and, and writing for the things that didn't exist for you. But were there other books or stories or authors who, whose influence kind of crept into the world of a land in any way? Oh yeah. Uh, well, it's funny when you were talking there, I was just thinking that when one of the things I liked, uh, one of the things that Stephen King did was he took like a horror story. It's like Dracula, right? I mean, it's a vampire story, but he modernized it. He's like, what would happen if that took place in a modern setting? How, how people react to it now? It wouldn't be the same way. And I like stories like that, that where they take this classic concept and they say, yeah, but if we put real people into it, what would that be like? <laughs> right. <laughs> and so when I wrote this, I did the same thing. I said, okay, we have a real fantasy setting. And I don't want to make these people morbid or overly formal the way they always seem to be depicted. What if they're real people like contemporary people? So instead of 
me showing you this time and place that's very alien to you, I translated everything. So it's just like you've lived there your whole life. So you can experience it as if they're normal people. So there's humor. There's, you know, there's real emotions that come out of the situation. And that's kind of how I approached it. But yeah, I mean, I pulled from, I mean, there was Stephen King, there was Hemingway, there was John Updike, there was uh, a whole bunch of people that I learned from essentially. And whenever I got to, a, I mean, if I got to a really creepy part that I wanted to give a lot of thick sort of creepiness to it, I mean, I would go to, you know, H.P. Lovecraft. I mean, it would give me the wording I needed and, and the concept and, and the feel, you know, and if I wanted something that was, you know, a really deep character study, I would probably go to Stephen King because he has a tendency to get in the heads of the weirdest people. Um, so whenever I needed something, there was always an author that I knew that I could go, oh, you know, that would be a really good source for this. And I might even read a few paragraphs of their stuff and then kind of like, OK, now keeping that kind of tone, let's mm -hmm. go with this. So, yes, yeah, I did that all the time. Yeah. yeah. Pulling from the greats. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, I feel like all of us that you are inspired and influenced by everything that you read. And it's mm -hmm. it's great to hear that you can take little uh, tips or tricks or whatever from completely different genres and, you know, apply them. Um, so another thing that uh, we personally, Adrian and I have talked about it before that we, we love about, about these stories is the dialogue. Like the dialogue is so good, uh, particularly, I mean, right from the very beginning with Royce and Hadrian. Um, so I was just wondering if Thank you, you for tips. using the name Hadrian, by the way. I really appreciate that. What? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hadrian and Adrian. You guys can be buddies. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just curious what if you have uh, if you have tips for writers, authors that are looking to write better dialogue, to write dialogue that rings true and, you know, to create voices that are distinct even without dialogue tags. Uh, so unfortunately, when it comes to my dialogue, I've always wondered about this because, I mean, people are like, oh, you, you write really funny stuff. I'm like, yeah, but I've never intended to. I mean, it's not it's not that I didn't know it was funny, but it's really <laughs> just the way I tend to think. So it's like if I was this character, this is how I would reply to it. And apparently I'm somewhat sarcastic because that kind of comes through. Um, but as to how to differentiate dialogue, um, if you just listen to people, quite frankly. In fact, it, there are certain things that when you learn to do them well, they ruin your life. Like when you learn to read or write well, you, reading is no much, not much fun. My wife has been dra dragged into editing and it's because she edits so much, she doesn't even like movies so much anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> but now I have it so that I actually analyze how people talk a lot. So, and I'm talking to someone, I will be, you know, that's the eighth time you have used the word like and you in four sentences. <laughs> and I will notice little phrases that people say because I'm like, you know, that that's actually something that could be used. Right. Yeah. So, so when you talk to different kinds of people, I, I have a tendency to take notice of how they speak. Uh, I notice that certain people repeat certain words, certain people have certain inflections they use over and over again. Um, and then of course there's older people and how they speak compared to younger people. Uh, certain people chop up their sentences. Other ones have complete sentences. If you're a formal speaker, you're going to have a, com I mean, if you're, let's say president Obama, you're going to have a very long, complete sentence structure that may be slow, but it will get there and it'll have all the parts. Whereas if you're talking with someone else who's like used to, you know, online, you, you, you'll get very short it stops. Oh, wait, no, actually. And that's how it breaks up. And so you have to recognize and match the dialogue to the type of person, because how they speak will also give you an idea of their character themselves, because how a person speaks reflects on how they think. And if a person thinks in a very long, drony way, it might be written that way as well. Mm -hmm. And it also reflects on where they came from, where they are now, so many different facets of life. Yeah, because yeah, because I I I picked up on this too. Where you know, editing a podcast, I listen to people's voices a lot. I listen to my own voice, and the way that I've approached podcasting has changed over the course of a year and a half. But also the way that every single guest speaks, so interesting to hear. You know, this is kind of uh, uh, a repetitive mannerism in your speech. Um, you know, <laughs> or you MJ text me and go, yeah. <laughs> MJ, you right. say, I love that too much. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I love everything. <laughs> Just a little behind the scenes, like giving MJ some shit, <laughs> but it is really interesting to see how, um, how people act and then listen to them and, and kind of translate in, into obviously on the page, right. you can't put an exact, uh, one-to-one. -one, Cause like you said, 
so many people clip their speech. So many people, it's sometimes it's just not readable. It gets but, annoying. Yes, because yeah. actually I did this. I would go to a coffee shop and I sat down with a laptop. And as I listened to a conversation at the table next to me, I would write exactly what they said. And mm-hmm. it is pretty much unreadable. Um, <laughs> so you would trim that down, obviously. And another thing you do is not only is how they speak, but there's action tags and attribution tags. And you don't want those to be the same. Now, I know most most educated people will tell you, you only use said. Well, I can tell you right now that is not true. <laughs> you, yeah. you do that, you get yourself in big trouble. Uh, you don't want to go using a lot of attribution variations, but at the same time, you don't want to just keep it locked into one. You do want to vary that quite a bit. In fact, you want to eliminate most of the need for the attribution, but then you want to vary those up. And one of the great way of doing it is action tags where the person does this or does this or you know something that shows you who's talking and gives you an idea of what kind of person they are. They may have a physical habit that they're constantly doing while talking, or whenever they say something, they might do something. These are things that you can watch and just pick up and steal from everyone around you, because while you cannot steal from another author, you can rip other people off constantly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought you have a t-shirt that said, you know, this is so going in my next novel. <laughs> I'm just a reality thief. Reality thief, amazing. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned you mentioned earlier how you had a little back and forth with your first book in terms of uh, publisher publisher interest, and then going self pub and all that. And eventually, uh, the series was picked up by <clears throat> Orbit Books, who re- who released the Rayera Revelations in a three book omnibus kind of way, each with two of the original books in it. So there's six books originally, but Orbit released them in three books with two books in each one. So <laughs> it's super confusing, but how did it, how did it feel for you originally going through this process? But then how did you feel about the, the, the way that the books were released and how that kind of unfolded? Uh, I didn't really like the idea of it going to Omnibus when they presented it. Uh, for me, that was a problem because I had designed each of these books to be standalone. They were supposed to be this way. Each one had a different look and feel. As I said, each novel was set in a completely different setting with this completely different, you know, sensibility about it. So putting them in, and when I was a kid, we used to have these, these classic books that were inverted like this. So you'd have Call of the Wild here and you'd flip oh, yeah. it over and you'd have, you I know, remember those. You'd hang yeah. on this side. And I thought those were so cheesy and I hated them. <laughs> when they presented this concept, I was not pleased. Um, but they had some good points. I mean, the idea was that if you go to a bookstore, uh, the odds of finding all six books there were going to be pretty slim. But if you only have three, it's a lot easier to keep in stock. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I can see that. But then I had to figure out how do I, I have to retitle them because I can't have the first one because it's not, it doesn't cover both books. So I went to the grocery store and on the way to the grocery store, I came up with three titles and I came up with the first one, which was pretty easy because there's a theft of two swords in it. It is funny how many people have read that book for years and went, oh my God, it just figured out the title. (laughs) So (laughs) then the next one, Rise of Empire made perfect sense. Uh, but the last one stumped me bizarrely for the longest time. And then I wasn't always driving home. I went, I got it. You know, cause it had to be three words. And, um, and yeah, so that was how that shaped up. I mean, the entire process was interesting because I mean, I was making really good money self publishing. So I didn't really need, uh, to go to New York at the time. And in fact, I thought there was a really good, a really fairly large concern that I would actually be losing a lot of money by going to New York. Uh, but I decided that the amount of uh, exposure I'd be getting from going to New York uh, would be worth essentially investing that money in the advertising. So with, as far as I'm concerned, when I went to a big publisher, it wasn't to you know make money. It was to essentially get advertising, which worked. And uh, it did like double or triple my, my readership. Plus the thing I didn't realize was that it also opened the doors to foreign translation rights, which was another huge source of, uh, of income, which I didn't even know existed really. I mean, we had a few people, but I didn't think it would be as lucrative as it turned out to be once I had a domestic, uh, mainline publisher. Yeah. 
Well, we've talked to a few other authors um, who began by self-publishing and then have later been picked up specifically by Orbit, actually, mm-hmm. uh, after their books, you know, found some traction in the indie market. Um, and so I'm I'm curious if your editor or your team at Orbit had you make any significant changes to, or to the story? Because, you know, we've had uh, uh, the last two folks that we've talked to uh, had to add like 20, 30,000 words, you know what I mean? Things like that. So was there anything like that during that process? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of funny because I got back a fairly large list of changes they wanted and I looked through it and I contacted my agent and I said, um, do I have to make these? (laughs) And she said, oh no, those are just suggestions. I said, suggestions as in you do this or else, or she says, oh no, 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 you, you know, it's up to you. I'm like, cause I'm going to step just about. 98% 98% of them, because there's like three things that I will change, the rest of it I'm not changing. And she goes, oh, you can do that. I'm like, good, which is what I did. Now, you have to understand most of these books, first five books of the series had already been self-published. They had already been read by thousands, tens of thousands of people. And they have been quite vocal about giving me feedback um, on you know Amazon or Goodreads or even an email. So I already knew what was wrong and what was right. So I was already planning on making at least five or six changes. Um, Orbit touched on one of them and the rest of them they didn't actually notice. But those were the ones I made changes to because I knew that the readership had complained that these were weird or this really bothered them. For a good example was in the very beginning, I did not start with the main characters. And every there's a lot of people who just put the book down because they didn't like the character I started with because he's a bad guy. And they were like, well, this is I don't want to read all this, all these pages about this guy. I'm a, so I realized I needed to put the main characters in start. That was one of the changes. Um, but there was a number of the little ones. But no, other than that, uh, no, I didn't really make any changes. And then subsequently, other books I did, uh, both through Orbit and later through Del Rey, um, I hardly received any any like editing changes from them except for Chronicles. that's really lucky except for chronicles yes mm-hmm. they wanted to- oh dude there's one or two yeah but huh? nothing there, was, there wasn't a lot no, of them no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing earth shattering though yeah i will say it's the most powerful <laughs> feeling in the world when All you right. go I'm gonna, I'm gonna, i love that interjection so <laughs> when you turned into Rayer Chronicles, yeah. your editor came to you and said, you have to change this book majorly because all your women are no, either. Yeah. No, I know. But I'm saying that was one suggestion out of No, but three. they were adamant about it. Oh, I know. I know they were adamant. And they were yeah. so adamant about the change. <laughs> they, even went to the, they even went to the UK, UK publisher right. and had her say, no, you have to change your entire book because <laughs> You got yeah. problems with all your women in, in the book. In in Chronicles <laughs> and in uh, the Del Rey Age books, uh, both of them had like one issue uh, that they wanted changed, and uh, needless to say, I didn't make it <laughs> in both cases, uh, except for the women. Which in, Robin is also <laughs> very adamant. In the first about. one, which is referring to this, it was a character um, who who. She said, you know, every character in your book is either a a horror, a murderer, or uh, I think that was it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> okay. And I said, yeah, I, I can see that. I said, but I can't change that because this is a prequel and those characters have already been established. They can't be altered because this is their history. So, I mean, sure, under normal circumstances, I would see what I could do. But right now I can't because I'm locked into this. And with Del Rey, it was interesting because they wanted me to make a change in which they, I had already sent this out to beta readers and their beta readers came back and they said, hey, you know, uh, this chapter, this chapter, I think it was 10 or nine. And they said this chapter 10 is ratings went, this is great. This is great. Great. Got the 10 and went right to the ground and went, oh, and I knew this was a potential problem because we jumped to a new group of people and there's a huge learning curve and there's a lot of information. And I went, okay. So what we did was we, I cut the data or the information in that chapter in half and I put it at five and 10 and I added more stuff that made it easier to read. So it was much more palatable. And then we did a second beta read. And then we did a second beta read and it worked great. So we knew it worked. Went over to Del Rey. They came back and I swear to God, this actually happened. <laughs> oh, no. He said, great book, but is there any way you can take chapters 10 and five and combine them 
So that I went. <laughs> you were like, it's so funny story. No. Fuck no. <laughs> Hell no, man. No, but the, the, cool, the cool thing for me is like that you've had so much good feedback from readers. Um, and that I almost get the feeling that that feedback is almost more meaningful to you than publisher feedback, because it's like the amount of people who read revelations, the, that whole series and the feedback that they gave you for that. And then orbit coming and be like, here's our list of things. And you being, well, I already know what's wrong with it because I have right. such a huge, huge pool of people who have given me their opinions. Well, and yeah. that almost feels like a bit more legitimate in, in this well, sense where you have to understand the publishers aren't my customers. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Publishers for me are essentially a service that I hire to get my books into the hands of readers. So yeah, the readers are way more important to me. In fact, we were at a convention once and I, I think it was in Chicago and uh, I had, I was there with the publisher and they wanted to take us out to dinner, but I had a single reader said they were coming to see me that night, but they were delayed. So I waited in the hobby and blew off the publisher so I could meet with my reader. Because they're much more important to me than the publisher is. Because the publisher, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't, I also don't hang out with my printers either. But you know, I mean, <laughs> readers are the people who pay my bills. They're the people yeah. who love what I do. I'm not so certain that the publishers. I mean, some publishers are fans. I will tell you that. Uh, people at Del Rey were huge fans of mine, uh, which I do appreciate. So I mean, I don't want to say anything bad about them. But nevertheless, yeah, uh, readers are paramount. Yeah, yeah, that's agreed. amazing. Yeah, because yeah, the publisher is ultimately like pretty much just the distribution arm, right? Of well, of that's right. I, I don't think anyone else thinks yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, publishers don't think that. No. <laughs> Hype themselves up a little bit more. There we um, go. <laughs> you've already brought up some of your other series, so I want to kind of touch on that. You've expanded upon Revelations in the world of a land significant, significantly, you know, with Chronicles with. The Legends of the First Empire, and more recently with The Rise and Fall, which was the the third book that you showed at the beginning of this episode. But how's it been for you to basically create this world from the ground up, but then continue to expand upon it across different time frames and just really sink yourself into it more than a lot of people do with with their with their works? You know, sometimes they write just a trilogy or a single series, and then that's it but you've gone back multiple times and really sunk yourself into it. I, I think mostly it's because I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> I mean, I could make a whole new world each time, but that's a lot of work. You know, <laughs> if I use the same world over and over again, I don't have to go through that. Instead I can focus. It, it, this is actually speaks to how I write because people, and in fact, and I started with the orbit, like, well, can't you change the names of the like, castles to something else or the Kings to some, so it seems more unique and it's not like, you know, so traditional. And I said, I could do that, but now the reader has to learn a whole new language and I have to like arbitrarily make stuff up. So like this actually means this and it takes a while for you to understand it. And that gets between the story and the reader or the characters and the reader. And I don't want to do that. I want to make it easy. Uh, I want you to not have that problem. So when I write a world, once you get used to the world, you don't have to worry about going through the, the world building part. You know that this does this and that does that. And this is a good area and this is a bad area. So that's already done, and you can get on the fun of the new characters and the new story. So that's part of the reason I do that, because it's, I mean, because I've been asked, I said, are you ever going to start a new fantasy world? I'm like, why on earth would I do that? <laughs> yeah. like, after all the time I've spent putting this one together? I don't like, think so. Like, <laughs> words. I have this extremely extravagant, I mean, it's like, you know, it, I don't know why they would think I would want to do that. If I, if I was going to start a new world, I would simply jump genres and go do something completely different, because I've already done this one. Uh, so. Yeah, it the only the only difficult thing for me is the fact that the more I put into it, the larger the database is and the harder it is for me to remember every little thing. Good thing is now and bad thing, I have readers who will let me know. So they'll come back and and they're well meaning and they but they will be very much along the lines of, Did you know that in chapter eight on page twenty seven you said this? I'm like, actually no. <laughs> Right. Like, I don't told, remember that. We told you about the wiki. We told and you about the wiki, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to kind of correct these things. And since I can't correct what's already been printed, I will retroactively correct it wonderfully because I can go back in time so I can switch the symbol. Mm. Elbow. <laughs> sneaky, sneaky. And 
Oh, yes. So I was writing one of the chronicles in which I got, I outlined the book. I started writing it. I got halfway through in which uh, the characters Royce and Hadrian are going to save uh, these group of people. One is, is Leo, uh, if you know who Leo is. Uh, and and then I was rereading uh, Revelations so because the Chronicles take place before Revelations. So I was rereading part of Revelations uh, and I discovered there's a single line of dialogue where Hadrian himself says he never before met Leo. And I'm like, oh, crap. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up having to totally restructure that novel so those two characters never actually meet. And that's wow. really hard to do. Imagine, I, I don't know, a Spider-Man movie where, you know, he can never actually meet <laughs> MJ, it's just, it's a, yeah. you go near each other, but they're both main characters in the story. It doesn't work. <laughs> we, I mean, funny enough, we had a question about like the challenges when it comes to plot holes and maintaining consistency yeah, within, within such an, an established overarching world. Established world. Yeah. <laughs> but there, if what it becomes is that initially you can do whatever you want, but as you establish things, they become supporting pillars and you can't move those. So you have to figure out what can I move safely and what right. cannot be moved. And I I do that research to make sure that works out. But sometimes I miss it because I got a lot of words. Right. Just a few. (laughs) So that kind of dovetails, I think, into another question I wanted to ask about um, your writing process and like how has it shifted over time or has it shifted over time or are you still following kind of the same processes you started with? Uh, No, it's always shifting. Uh, In between every book, I do something different. But uh, I mean, initially, I was essentially a discovery writer. I think most writers are when they first start, unless they've had some sort of formal training. But I think everyone just sits down and starts writing because it's fun. And I did that. But as as I started to get more and more serious about it, I realized I was wasting an enormous amount of time because I would write 50,000 words and go, oh, this won't work. Got to start over. I'm like, yeah, screw that. Yep. I'll, I'll write a new book. So <laughs> this is I was publishing. But when I started actually making money, it became more and more important to be able to have a clearer idea where I was going. So there was less chance of me screwing up. But at the same time, if you do too much of that, then it becomes very contrived and stiff and it you don't allow yourself to take advantage of happy accidents. Uh, so could do that. So I always have a tendency to figure out how far I can go with the outlining. And so initially I would outline, you know, just a full bullet points and I would start writing. Nowadays, I actually have a, and you'll love this, this method. So I, I sit down and I will plot out the book. And when I start to write it, I, I have these things here, these, these notebooks. And what I will do is um, I'm going to write a chapter tomorrow. I will at Four o'clock, half happy hour, I'll take one of those notebooks and my safety little, my trusty little fountain pen, and I will mix myself a drink, put on some nice music, and I will conceptualize what the next chapter is going to be. I will like run some of the dialogue in my head. And if I hit anything really neat and cool, I'll jot that down. Just, I'm not writing the dialogue. I'm not, well, sometimes you, but I'm not writing anything specific. I'm just like, okay, remember, this is a really cool idea. I'm going to put that in. And this is a really cool idea. I'll put that in. And I do this for like an hour. So when I come back to work the next morning, and I usually write in the mornings, I will just sit down and go, I have a list of things. And I just like rip them off and it builds by itself. And I used to do, I used to walk to a coffee shop. And when I would do that, I would think, and when I get to the coffee shop, I'd write down what I thought. And then I come back home, same deal, and I write it down. But that kind of concept of having the book outlined mostly in advance and then daily thinking about what the next chapter is going to be about or what the next scene is going to be about and just lightly jotting it down. That's works out really well. And as I've gotten older and as I've gotten more comfortable with my writing, <clears throat> what I've realized is that slower it seems to be better because if I take more and more time to reflect on the story, like I come up, this is a great idea. Don't write it yet. Have a drink. Think about it again. Sleep on it the next day. And now we'll come up with better ideas or I'll take that idea and I'll add to it. It will add more depth. And sometimes like I'll go away for a week and I'll come back and go, oh, thank God I went away for a week because I came up with a much better idea. Yeah. And it makes the book a lot richer and a lot fuller and a lot it makes a lot more sense a lot of the time. So that's a lot of the different changes I've gone through. I think I think that that methodology is really good. I actually have similar notebooks like the the moleskins. Yeah. Um, kind of notebooks where I don't write out full chapters there. It's mostly like 
ideation and and just jotting bullet down points, cool stuff yeah. bullet points lots and lots of bullet points here's a really cool line of dialogue this is a potential like interaction between these two characters but i think the way that um that you kind of frame it in terms of setting yourself up the day before for your next day to be more successful is a very good way to approach it where you can sit down, put your ass in the chair the morning yeah. of and know that and yesterday yeah. I prepped myself a little bit and I have something right. to jump off of and actually also, just get right into it. Also, what I will do to begin writing is I will actually read someone else's book uh, who I want as a pace car for that book. If I find a book mm. that just kind of matches it, because I tend to write when I mean I write fast. I don't mean I physically write fast. I mean the plotting uh, is moving too quickly. I need to slow down, put more description, put more other things in it. And if I read someone else's book who's doing that, I will get that pace, that rhythm, that musical rhythm. That And then when I start reading, what I'll do is I'll look at what I wrote the day before, like the last couple pages. And I'll go, after picking up that, I read this and go, oh, no, see, I need I need another bit of you know something in here to fill that out and make it richer. And then I move on and I get that pace again and then just keep going. That way I never have a start with a, with a blank page. I'm never having to sit there and go, what now? Because I know what I'm going to write and I'm in the flow of where I left off. It's like when you guys are doing audio, or at least when we do audio, you never want to just drop in a cut. You want to drop in a bit, a bit, a bit, and that's where you cut it. And if you have to drop it in, you start with a sentence before. So it's flowing. You don't drop in with the beginning of it because then you'll have a, a high point or a low point that doesn't match the rest of the dialogue. So yeah, that's how I do it. I just start with what I did before and just roll on through you just know keep the momentum going. It, it gets a little better yeah i was gonna say it it keeps you away from the fear of the blank page which is a very real fear <laughs> so yeah yeah but also the the fear over the fear of too much just sitting and self-critiquing and then well, yeah. editing something where it's just like just, <laughs> just fucking write it move on like yeah. let it let it breathe let it simmer you know you'll probably jot down another idea in the future and you can come back to it and add it during revision you know there's no can always fix it in post. Yeah. Can always <laughs> fix it in post. Exactly. MJ. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you love it. <laughs> I do. Um, so with this new, with this, uh, newest series, the rise and fall, how does it feel for you to wrap it up? Not only to wrap up, uh, this series in particular, but also to wrap up another series in the world of Valen. and then looking ahead, what kind of plans do you have for future stories within this world? Uh, so the rise and fall is really what I always called the bridge series because it's it's taking the really old prequels and the really new ones. So you have like uh, you know you have your your mid medieval story and then you went I went all the way back to the Bronze Age. So I needed like the Roman Empire period in between so that you could see the the through line and it have it all make sense. So it really wasn't like I was completing uh, a new series because it really was putting this little mini part in the whole. Uh, yeah. Now, the only difference is that, of course, I never like doing the same thing twice. So these were very different books in the sense that they're based on individuals. That's why each one has an individual name. There's, there's Nolan, there's Fairlane, and there's Ezra Hutton. These are actual people. I've never done that before in my books. Uh, and in fact, Ezra Hodden is unusual because of that one. I literally, for the first time ever, started with a character as a child and showed his whole life as you go through it. So never did that before. As a matter of fact, I hate usually that in most fantasy because it's so prevalent. It's too <laughs> often used. Every single fantasy novel starts with the main character as a child. And like Beautiful coming of age. No one ever Wheel of time. <laughs> but no one does this. You read a thriller novel. They don't start with the main character. You read Sherlock Holmes. You didn't start with Sherlock Holmes as a child. I mean, these are things that no one usually does except <laughs> in fantasy because it's like that's how we go. Imagine, imagine just like a thriller buildings Roman or something like that. <laughs> So, like, this is so thrilling. Wow. So I, I read that and and uh, it, it really wasn't like completing a novel. It was like fitting in the final piece in a Jenga thing. It's just now it's done. It's complete as far as that's concerned. Uh, but it isn't completely complete because there are always a few questions. And it, it's like, I don't know, no matter what I do, if I write this happened here, they'll say, yeah, but what happened after or what happened? Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't keep doing this because you're just going to keep me doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so there are some questions, obviously, people are going to have uh, at the end of this this series, and I've been trying to determine what to do about that. Um, it's a matter of I could walk away from Elan at this point and go on to other genres, which I had planned on doing. 
Uh, on the other hand, because when I finished Raya Revelations, the ending of that was great. I didn't want to touch it. It was it was perfect. Everything tied up. I was done with it. So I never wanted to go beyond that. However, and, and the other problem was each book I do is I wanted to be better than one before in Raya Revelations. So when I got to the end, <clears throat> the end one was so epic. Stakes were so high that there's no way I can top that. Uh, unless I were to go back in time 3,000 years and write a prequel series, which I did, in which I insert the one little thread that I had put in the revelations just in case. There's a character in there who did something really weird and is not talked about much. People have found it. And if I took that thread and pulled on it, I could literally make a through line between all the books that starts another story that's even more epic and more dramatic with more at stake than what happened in Revelations. Problem is, uh, to, at this point, take everything I've done <clears throat> and turn that into a, like, cohesive idea. So all the stuff I made up as I went, now I have to make it seem as if everything I did was intentional and <laughs> for a point. <laughs> And I have to make the ending bigger and better than anything that came beforehand. And that's not easy. Okay. <laughs> so it, it would take a number of books, not just like in a follow up series, but it would take a number of other books just to set up that follow up series. So I'm looking at a huge amount of work. And I'm not young. I'm getting older. I heard Brandon Sanderson complaining he had to get people to take over his Cosmere when and if he died. And I'm like, my God, you're the same age I was when I got published. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. You're concerned about this. So if that was 20 years ago. I'm not sure if I can actually write all the books. And I don't absolutely, under any circumstances, want to leave readers without the ending. As a result... I will probably begin writing something along this lines to see if it will work. If it doesn't work, I won't publish any of it. If it does work and I get it done, then I'll publish it. Because I don't want readers to read halfway and went, oh, yeah, this was great. It's the greatest books I've ever read in my life. And now he died. You know, we don't want that. I, I mean, I don't want that. No, of course not. I mean, you're still young and spry compared to like, you know, sorry, George Martin, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's just a lot of, there are a lot of, I think a lot of readers who have invested in, in things where they, they take an unhealthy ownership o over it in terms of the way that they treat the author. And it's like, nobody should treat George R. R. Martin that way. Nobody should treat Scott Lynch that way or yeah. whoever, you know, Patrick Rothfuss, but you know, Michael, like, I totally understand where you're coming from. At the very least, you have a lot of complete series within this world. Oh, yeah. But I love the idea that you're going to tie threads between everything and make it even more epic, which is just like... Well, it, it, it's know. basically taking a really complicated chess game and then taking it and going three-dimensional with it. Mm -hmm. And that even hurts my mind. And <laughs> I think it's so far. But to do that, it's really, really complicated. And there's a lot of things that have to make sense in the end, but it also has to be continuously working with the, everything that came before that wasn't planned. So I have to figure out ways to twist this to make it all make sense. And actually, good news is I, I've, I've gotten quite a bit of it done so far as just concept, and it's kind of working out. Um, but like I said, uh, I, I do want it to be complete cause I also don't want to have a crappy thing either. Cause I don't want to ruin what I've already written. I will. I don't want, I don't want you to read this book and say, this was really, really good. And then he ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> Rather not put it oh. out. No, but I think you've got several, you know, kind of checks and balances, Robin being your main one in order to, you know, help him not do that. Yeah, and, there uh, you go. I think Utilize the wiki at this yeah, point. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think you can it use will the wiki. You. I think it will help you. You can reference it. Man, <laughs> I need my own wiki. I can't keep track. I only have two books. I can't even keep track of details for mine. I can't imagine with 12. Yeah, but you use <laughs> Excel spreadsheets. I don't know how you lose track. I do. I do remember, I think it was, was it George R. R. Martin that when he had problems, he actually would contact his 
his, his base and ask them questions like, what happened yeah. with this character? And they would go, oh, we know all this. It's all right here. We have a spreadsheet for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the person who did his wiki ended up helping him to write like the world history of yeah. Westeros. That's book. amazing though. Because yeah, um, why not use that resource? Yeah. Because there are readers that are going to be fresher on books yeah. than you were because you wrote them longer ago than they read them. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, thank yep. you for your beautiful neuroticism. all right michael well to close out uh i would like to ask you two things if you could give listeners and viewers a a good bit of soundbite writing advice and b to tell us a weird or random fact that you find to be utterly fascinating a good soundbite writing advice uh well i mean most basic one i can give you is to write what you want to read um if you write something that you think people want to read that's not going to work write what you like. And as long as you're a human being, other human beings will like it too. <laughs> That's great advice. Yeah. Uh, a, a good um, random fact that you find to be utterly fascinating. Ooh, a random <laughs> fact. There wow. so There's so many. I, mean, I actually keep I know. the computer. I would like to look it up. Um, <laughs> I, I actually have really, because when I do research, I was like, really? That That's true? I'm like, that's yeah. Me. But it's the one with the uh, thing in the eye. Oh, jeez. Yeah, so I steal from history a lot. Everyone can do that. You're allowed. Uh, one of them was the fact that uh, Newton was known to have done some pretty extravagant things in his, his experimentations. And when he was studying optics, he actually took a needle and put it into his eye to see. What? No. So I stole that completely and I put that in my book. And I think people think that my character is crazy. I'm like, no, actually this happened because the, the character in the book is a genius and they're doing the exact same thing because they're so focused on it. They don't, they're, they're like, I need to know the answer to this. So I'm like, right. yeah, it was actually he was. He observed like the colors he yeah. saw and stuff as he was. Oh God. What? That gives me yeah. so much of the ick. <laughs> That is like the complete opposite for me. I'm like, that's so fascinating. Yeah, I, I don't even like going to the do- eye doctor because like anything it's coming near funny. my eye freaks me out. <laughs> really enough, you could put a needle in your eye and take it out. And it, it didn't yeah. hurt him to do this apparently. But oh, I no. was lucky. There's, there's not, there's not. He just yeah. wanted to know. It is a fascinating fact, but I hope to never hear it again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's recorded. So there you go, MJ. <laughs> I, I think it's really cool. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking weird. I write about mushrooms. So what do I know? I love it. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with MJ and I. Also, Robin in the background. Uh, Michael, can you please let folks know where they can find you on social media? Actually, no. Robin, get in. <laughs> where can they find me on social media? Well, tap in. Uh, Actually, we're right in the middle of having our website redone. Uh, we, okay. we've, we've got a mess as far as websites are concerned. <laughs> uh, but uh, www.riira, R-I-Y-R-I-A, uh, dot com is kind of our main website. We also have a website called The First Empire. They should have all been under one. Um, and should have, would have, could have. And it's only 15 <laughs> years to finally start pulling them together. And that's actually in in you know, an in-process work. So I think, I think the new website is going to be www.michaeljsullivanauthor.com. Okay. But it doesn't exist at the moment. Yeah, it'll take you a week to type it in. <laughs> no then, one's going to show up. And then he's on Goodreads. He's uh, Twitter. He's author underscore Sullivan. Um, right. we, we have a Facebook, but I don't think we've used it. In I don't even know how to log into that. Yeah, I know. No, it's been <laughs> so long. <laughs> That's why Robin's your business manager. It yeah. all works out. Yeah, that, 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 <laughs> I have no idea because, like she said, we're under transition as far as the website's concerned. So, so right. no, you, you can't find me. Just forget about it. Don't read anything <laughs> by me. It's just, you know. <laughs> yeah, just enjoy this episode and then just uh, just right. fade away. <laughs> Type anyway, Michael just all of us. You'll get yeah. things like people sticking needles in their eyes, and you don't want that. <laughs> No, you've you been write warned. It, you write it. There are people who want to read it. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, you can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram, Twitter, and threads at SFF Addicts Pod, or you can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. MJ, what about you? Yeah, you can find me across all the main socials Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, at MJ Kuhn Books, all one word, or MJKuhn.com. And you oh, can yeah. And buy my book. book. I always forget to say that. Buy my book. Yeah. <laughs> not like not like this not like yeah. this 
It's yeah. by a mysterious person. We don't know, yeah. but it looks really cool Among from the thieves, cover. So you should probably just anonymous. buy it. I don't know. Yeah. Go get that. <laughs> just go get that by MJ. Spider-Man's yeah. girlfriend wrote this awesome yeah. book. <laughs> Ghost written by Zendaya. <laughs> <laughs> Ghost written by Zendaya. There you go. Perfect. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. Stay tuned next week for part two with Michael, where he'll be joined by his wife and business partner, Robin, for our mini masterclass on building a dedicated fan base. For now, keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts.